I want to introduce you to our next uh, speaker in line. And again, remember, he's going to give you a kind of an outlook, prediction, uh, no guarantees. I tried to get him to guarantee, but he, he wouldn't commit to that. But Brian Bledsoe is the chief meteorologist and climatologist at KKTV 11 News in Colorado Springs. Uh, he, has, uh, he started off, uh, he grew up on a ranch uh, near Lyman, Colorado. And uh, somehow he got involved in weather, and it probably is that everybody around him, it seems like in agriculture, we're always talking about the weather, either wondering when the next rain is or if it's going to be dry enough to cut hay, etc. So he kind of gained an interest in that and uh, decided to go to school for it, and he went to the University of Northern Colorado in 90, 97 with a meteorology degree and uh, became a meteorologist and got into broadcasting in Wyoming. Uh, and since then he's moved, made his way through a couple of TV stations, but because of his ranching background, uh, he's always had an interest in looking at weather outlook and trying to help farmers and ranchers try to predict and look at what's going to happen in the short term and maybe even the long term future to help them try to make some management decisions, and a lot of it came from his time he spent growing up on the ranch. Uh, he also, as far as his tie back to Texas, he does some work with the Southern Livestock Standard and is their, uh, their, their kind of their weather guru for that publication. So with that, let's give Mr. Brian Bledsoe a big round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Appreciate it. How y'all doing today? Even I'm smart enough not to give guarantees when it comes to weather, because that's kind of the losing business. But uh, to be honest with you folks, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to come here and speak to you guys here at the Shore Course. Uh, my presentations, anybody that's ever seen me talk or have followed my publications uh, through the standard, know that I, my main goal is to throw as much at you as possible. I don't believe in holding anything back, um, and I try to give you guys a lot of tools in very plain language to help you make better decisions for your business. Uh, and I hope that I've been able to do that for some of you through the standard uh, because uh, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun for me to not only interact with uh, you folks from Texas or anywhere along the Gulf Coast, but uh, also through the Western Plains. So I got a lot to say this afternoon. I'm gonna be at the Southern Livestock Standard booth. If you've got questions, I encourage you to stop by. I love talking weather, whether it's about what I'm talking about here today or something completely different. Uh, but I'm going to try to make sense of it uh, all for you here today, if that is possible. That's my main goal. Uh, the big thing that I think forecasters messed up last year, including even myself who we were looking at, a lot of times forecasters just simply focus on El Nino or La Nina. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with those terms. But to be honest with you guys, it's not just about La Nina or El Nino. There are so many other different things that are going on. In fact, here's a handful of oscillations that we can look at uh, on a particular year uh, from the MJO up there at the top all the way down to exactly what the sun is doing. They are all extremely important when we're talking about long range weather. And oh, lo and behold, I've even given a little bit of a uh, secret to you right here. This right here. You guys want to check out those oscillations right there for yourself? You can go to that same website. If you don't have time to write that down, come by the booth and I'll hook you up with it. Or you can just simply Google weather oscillations. It'll come right up there for you. But just to give you an idea, there's a whole laundry list of stuff that we can talk about. Specifically, what made ports, uh, parts of Texas wet last uh, winter? The MJO. It's a Madden Julian oscillation. This guy starts way over in the western Pacific Ocean. It's uh, predicated on the amount of thunderstorm activity that they see over there. When it gets active, this oscillation gets carried all the way across the Pacific Ocean into the eastern Pacific right here along South America. You may be scratching your head saying, well, what's South America got to do with us up here? It is huge. It's huge. And you can see what happened last year when we went from the worst drought the state's ever seen uh, and the worst regional drought a lot of folks have ever seen uh, to the complete opposite starting in October. Uh, but bottom line, when we have a La Nina episode that's getting ready to weaken or it's getting ready to change phase, the MJO becomes extremely active. Now last year, 
we really didn't change phase a whole lot. We kind of stayed with that La Nina thing, and that's where us as forecasters learned something. It confused us a little bit, and it's all part of this learning process because there's so much we have to learn when it comes not only to just day-to-day -day weather, but it comes to long-term forecasting. But because the La Nina weakened enough, it allowed this MJO to become extremely active. I've charted the MJO for you here all the way back to January of 2005, where you see the red spikes here, that's where the MJO is extremely active and that usually means that we're going to have wetter than normal conditions across this, at least the southern United States. Uh, usually you'd like to get the MJO, if you look over here at the scale, you'd like to get it above two to really see some increased activity. So come down here with me, uh, down here to last October, maybe we can go before that. Let's go back to the previous October. Look at the MJO, completely negative, completely non-existent. That bred the drought. You can see it continuing all the way through here, right through September of 2011. And then it completely flipped. And once that MJO got active, look at that. There wasn't a negative part of it until we got here into May. What happened in May? Quit raining. Even in April, it just shut off. Folks, you want to track that for yourself and you want to make long-term forecast, here's one of the tools, okay? It's, it's black and white. When it's active, it usually means active weather for especially the southern tier of the U.S. Here's another one. All the global warming folks that want to jump on that, anybody that's read my articles in the standard know just how in love I am with global warming. Um, they wanted to know why these records were breaking in March. They wanted to know where the winter went. This Arctic Oscillation, when this Arctic Oscillation is in a positive phase, it keeps all that cold air bottled up into Canada and up toward the Arctic Circle. Okay, when it's negative, we get cold here in the US. It's just that simple. So if you go up here to the top, it charts it right there, that solid line in the middle, that's just where it's kind of neutral. But look at this, I think it'd be a safe to say that uh, even as far back as April, we can continue it all the way through, it's been nothing but neutral or positive uh, for a long time. And that's why we didn't have any winter in many parts of the country. All that cold air was bottled up to the north, okay? People were saying, well, we're breaking records from the 50s. So, records are made to be broken. North Atlantic Oscillation. People are baking right now in Oklahoma. Kansas, my backyard in Colorado. We've had one of the hottest summers in a long time in Colorado. How long? Since last summer, okay? <laughs> the hottest summer on record last year in Colorado Springs. For any of you that have ever been to Colorado Springs, our elevation is 6,300 feet. For us to get to 90 degrees, it's a pretty hot day there, okay? Last year, our, or last summer, our average high temperature for the summer was 88 degrees it beat the previous record by four degrees, okay? This year, uh, if you've heard of the Waldo Canyon fire, which I'm sure some of you had, the day the fire went nuts, we set an all-time record high of 101 degree. Colorado Springs, that's hot stuff, folks, okay? But this North Atlantic Oscillation is to blame. When this uh, oscillation goes negative, it blocks the whole weather pattern. So whatever you're seeing, that's what you get. Okay, there's no progression in it. And look what's gone on here since, I mean, it's been somewhat neutral here, but look what's gone on since June. Complete negative territory. Do you know over in the UK, they've had the wettest summer ever, ever. It broke 200 year old record this year. It's got to do with this, okay? With that wa weather patterns being blocked up, what you see is what you get for a long period of time and that can be uh, directly attributed right here to this oscillation, the NAO. So, now that we've talked about a couple of those initial ones, let's talk about El Nino, because a lot of people are talking about El Nino and the importance of it, and it is important. I'm not gonna argue with you there, okay? But I wanted to show you the weather patterns associated with each. The top one here is the El Nino weather pattern. Jet stream barrels in off the Pacific Ocean, right in the southwestern United States, and right here over the entire southern U.S., it's usually wetter and cooler than normal. You guys remember what 09 and 10 was like? Kind of wet, kind of cold, okay? That was an El Nino year. You guys remember what last year was like? Bottom. Big old ridge of high pressure out here in the Gulf of Alaska. 
jet stream was way up to the north. That's pretty classic, what we saw last year. So uh, two years ago, when I was making a forecast for some of my customers, some of my customers are my family, uh, I told them 14 months ahead of time that this pattern was going to set up, okay? And that they'd better take the necessary precautions to, to prepare for something. I didn't know it was going to be the worst drought a lot of folks had had in a long time. I just knew it was going to be really, really dry. And a lot of times that's all you need to make those kind of decisions. Um, by the same token, it's also extremely important to recognize periods of time when they're going to be wetter than normal. And in the recent patterns where we've been dealing with drought more than we have uh, excess water, um, those little windows of opportunity are incredibly important to producers. Here's what El Nino looks like right now. These are sea surface temperature anomalies, plus or minus, okay, compared to the normal. And right here off the west coast of South America, we've got warmer than normal water right now. El Nino's just getting started, just a little baby. It's been trying to develop and hasn't had a whole lot of luck so far because of this gigantic cold pool that is situated near Hawaii and just to the west. This water tries to warm, tries to spread across the uh, Pacific Ocean, and this colder than normal water shuts it off. Now this cold pool has warmed a little bit, okay, here recently. And for that reason, I really think this El Nino is going to continue to mature uh, here as we head into fall. And that's, that's good news for a lot of folks, okay? This may be too late for you if you want rain in August, unless we can get a tropical storm or something like that to come up. But as far as a pattern break, as far as the heat, if you're in Oklahoma, you're in Kansas, or right in my backyard in Colorado, this break and when it happens is going to be incredibly important. This is called the Southern Oscillation Index. It tracks the pressure patterns that are associated with El Nino and La Nina, okay? Where you're seeing it uh, in the negative phase right here, that's El Nino. Look at that, back in January of 2010, extremely uh, strong El Nino conditions during that period of time. And then look at what we did when the drought set in. We go way up here to positive territory, up to positive about 34, uh, during that uh, La Nina, weakened it, then it came back, a lot weaker than it was before, and shorter. And then since January, or there just shortly after, we've seen this Southern Oscillation Index take a little fall, bigger fall, bigger fall, and then this is the next fall that it's going to take, likely into where El Nino will start to mature and continue to uh, mature this fall. These are computer model outlooks as far as what uh, it actually thinks, the model thinks that uh, El Nino or La Nina is gonna do. And this tracks, this is called the CFS, this is the coupled forecasting system. It's a government run model here in the US. I have a problem with our, our government run models here in the US because a lot of times they're reactionary to the particular weather pattern that we're dealing with, okay? They're not forecasting truly, they're, um, they're reacting to what the pattern is doing, so if they, kind of get the pattern right and what it's doing, they're pretty good. But if they're wrong, they can be horrifically wrong, okay? So um, what I'm looking at right now is the pattern. Model's got the pattern pretty much right. It takes it up here along this dotted line. It kind of maxes out uh, the El Nino episode, and kind of a weak, uh, weak event and short-lived uh, somewhere during early winter, and then kind of weakens it as we head into the springtime. Every one of those lines is a different model run, okay? They're just little different runs of the same thing, all looking at the same stuff. Its cousin looks like this, tracking the same way, but continues the El Nino episode for just a little bit longer, okay? Lingers it over here, FMA, February, March, April, and lingers it right there. But both models are not showing a strong El Nino. So if you're hearing from your weather source or anywhere across the country that this is going to be a strong El Nino, I'd take argument for that, okay? I just don't think that's going to happen. Let's look at some of the foreign models. I love the foreign models. A lot of these models are, are a lot better than the ones that we have here in the US. This one comes out of Europe. Uh, it's from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. And again, all these separate lines are just different little ensemble runs of the same thing, but you can just kind of draw the middle line right there, and it's about the same, okay? Uh, anything that's dropping below zero and headed back toward La Nina territory uh, this winter, I ignore. That's not going to happen. We don't have to worry about that. By the same token, anything that's way up here in strong El Nino territory, I don't buy that either. 
This one's out of Australia. Same thing, takes us above neutral, keeps us and kind of holds us there right through, uh, right through springtime, early spring. This is out of Japan, same deal, right through there. So for me as a forecaster, when I see a lot of model data, not only domestic but foreign, agreeing on the same thing, that gives me pretty good confidence going forward that that's kind of where we're headed. But it's not that easy. You have to take the information that's current and that the, the information that you're given, and you've got to match it with history. I love history. Analog years. Analog meaning a year that is analogous to uh, the pattern that you're dealing with right now. Okay, so we're trying to match past year's weather with present so we can move to the future. History is an excellent teacher, obviously in everything, especially in weather. It's tough to get an identical match, okay? But they are remarkably accurate at predicting the future weather if you can similarly, similarly match up main drivers in your climate and weather with past and present. Currently, we are reliving the 1950s. I'm sure that that's not the first time that you guys have heard something like that before. We are also headed toward the 60s and 70s. And that was the focus of my, uh, this month's article in the Southern Livestock Standard, if you folks are interested. Southern Oscillation Index, we looked at a little while ago. Again, if you look at this, all you need to know is the negative numbers are El Nino months, positive numbers are La Nina. Back here in the 50s, look at this, 54. Positive numbers, positive numbers, positive, positive. You had a double dip La Nina episode in the mid 50s. Crippling drought, crippling drought. Then after that double La Nina episode, we went into weak El Nino, 57, 58. Why do I have 57, 58 highlighted in red? Because I believe 57, 58 is an, uh, an analog year for where we're going in tw uh, rest of 2012 and into 2013. We don't even have to look back to the 50s for an analog year. We have the benefit of having the main climate drivers and the main weather drivers right now that are in place, were in place just a few years ago, and they've been in place since about 2005. Lo and behold, here in 2006, we went to weak El Nino. Right after that, we went to weak La Nina, drought, came out of it, weak El Nino, 09 and 10, and then double dipping again into that El, uh, La Nina time frame. Um, the back half of 2010, all of 2011, and then January of 2012. So we're coming back out of it, and look at this. We're starting to go weak El Nino territory again. Lo and behold, just like we did back in 2009. So to match these patterns is, uh, is a long range forecaster is one of his best guides uh, to go back and find what, what is really driving the weather. Uh, and the Southern Oscillation Index and charting it and going back and looking uh, is incredibly important. So 06, 07, pretty good analog gear. 09 and 10, I believe is an excellent analog gear and like I showed you, 57, 58, excellent. And I'm working to find others in the 70s. The problem with the 70s is the main climate drivers weren't the same as that they are now, so I'm really wrestling with that. For those of you that read my articles, uh, this is old hat to you. I constantly talk about these major oceanic oscillations in the PDO, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, and the AMO, the Atlantic Multi-Decadal Oscillation. We've charted them all the way back to 1900, where you see the red spikes, that's the warm or the positive phase of the ocean. Where you see the blue spikes in the negative territory, that's the cold or the negative phase. So here in the Pacific, let's start with it first. Look here in the 50s. From about, say, ooh, 43 or 4, the Pacific switched phase from warm to cold. And it went from uh, those early to mid 40s all the way to the great climate shift of 1978. For those of you that remember in the 70s, there were a lot of scientists talking about ice ages. And what did they start talking about in the 80s? Global warming, okay? Do I think that's an accident? Because the Pacific immediately started to shoot into its warm phase right after 78? No, I know they're not stupid. I know they're looking at the same stuff we are. But it's how they use that information that can sometimes be quite dangerous. 
The 50s were a classic example of a negative PDO, more La Ninas, more drought, extreme drought in certain cases. Let's look up here to the Atlantic. The Atlantic was warm back here in parts of the 30s, the 50s, then it went cold here in the 70s. Do you think it's by accident that they started talking about ice ages when both oceans were in their negative or their cold phase? I mean, I'm asking, just doesn't it stand to be good common sense that if both of these big, huge bodies of water are colder than normal, doesn't it stand to re uh, reason that we would be colder than normal on the land masses surrounding them? I think so. Maybe that's just me being too commonsensical, though. I don't know. Back in the 50s, though, negative PDO, warm, uh, warm AMO. Here where we are right now, negative PDO, warm AMO. Do you see why I'm talking about reliving the, uh, reliving the 50s? These oceans are huge climate drivers, huge. This might be one of the most important graphics I'll ever show a farmer or a rancher. Uh, this pertains to drought frequency. Where you see the positive and the minus, okay? So that's positive PDO, warm ocean, negative, cold ocean. So we are right now, right here. Where you see all of this red, increased drought frequency by quite a bit. And you can see the bullseye areas, okay? What's failing this year? The corn belt. Bullseye's the corn belt. What failed last year? Texas, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma. What's failing this year? Colorado in particular, okay? It's not a perfect road map, but it definitely has things under control and has a good grasp of the information that's important. Where are we headed? In the next five to 10 years, we're headed right here, lower left. Great news for Texas, right? Looks pretty good. Probably won't start to uh, really feel these effects for even a while longer, but the fact that we are shifting from this to this is great news here for a lot of Texas. And with Texas in particular, it seems to be a real problem whenever the Atlantic is in its warm phase. Not only does that warm Atlantic breed heat, it just seems to breed drought. But for me in Colorado, my Colorado customers, Western Kansas, uh, for a lot of the wheat country and cattle country, problems. I've been telling my dad for the past uh, few years, I said, you know, um, they have a plan in place every year, as I'm sure most of you guys do for if weather, uh, whatever type of weather happens. And when that weather doesn't happen, um, you've got to put that plan into action. He's had to sell uh, half the herd this year because it just, it's just not cost effective to pay $250 a ton for delivered hay and to keep that going when I told him it's not gonna rain, um, it's just not. Um, so that's where we're headed, guys, right there. And again, it's not perfect, I say five to 10. The Atlantic has been warm since 95. So here we are on 12, that's 17 years, usually lasts 15 to 25, um, but rest assured when that Atlantic starts to turn cold, I'm gonna be chirping about it. Let's look at the sun. I've got 130 years of the sun here for you. Look on this bottom graph. Wherever you see these spikes, that's where the sun is going through a maximum in output of energy. Um, look at the 30s back here, okay? Maximum output of energy. Big one here, 50s. Uh, 70s, a little less. 80s a good spike, but look where we've come down. This is where we are right here. Does this look anything like any of these? Looks nothing like it. This right here looks a lot like it did in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And a large part of the earth froze in those years. This is the problem I have with this global warming stuff. This is why they've renamed global warming climate change. But the sun's pretty interesting to look at, isn't it? It's pretty cool. Give you some model forecast for where we're headed. 
September, October, November. This is off the CFS model, has a good handle of where we are and likely where we're going. Right here, where you see the blue, below normal temperatures, where you're seeing the brown here, uh, the likelihood of above normal temperatures. So this is September, October, November. I really think that most of this brown right here is uh, attributed to September because October, November have completely erased this extreme bubble of heat that is built across Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, uh, and, uh, and Colorado for the most part, okay? Uh, but this, this pattern is going to break, and when it breaks, I think it's going to break big time for a lot of folks that haven't seen, uh, haven't seen much cool weather or rain for quite a while. And the West Coast, this is important too because that's where our storms are gonna come from. So if the West Coast right here is wetter than normal, that's gonna mean pretty active storm track coming in across the Western United States during that time. November, December, January. That's pretty chilly stuff. That's pretty chilly stuff. For the computer model to be picking up this type of a signal in the Corn Belt, the Great Plains dipping all the way down to about Dallas uh, is pretty significant this early. I follow a forecaster who's dead now. Uh, his name is Jerome Nemias. He was a pioneer. And he had a theory about what he called the rubber band effect. And his theory was history shows that whenever you see one extreme that's been so extreme for so long, you will see the opposite extreme for a similar amount of time. And when it snaps, there's no graduation to it at all. It's quick, okay? I believe that the fall and early winter could very well be just like that. And if you uh, look through history, this is almost identical to what happened in 09 and 10. Almost identical. I'm even happy about this little sliver in northeast Colorado. I'd take all the snow in the world right now. Might not say that in March, but. And then we go February, March, April. Uh, classic El Nino signature is to have Alaska and the Pacific Northwest warmer than normal. So that gives me a little confidence to say at least through the first three months of 2013, El Nino is going to be playing some type of role here in temperature, okay? Uh, but still, look up here in the, in the Great Lakes, the Northeast, and even down here along the Gulf Coast, and even down here in South Texas. While the model may not have this big blue area painted all the way across Texas, the fact that it is thinking about that and the fact that at the very least it's got it near normal, I would say stands to reason that uh, pretty good shot that Texas and along the Gulf Coast is going to be colder than normal for this winter. Moisture. I can't help what's going on right now uh, through the rest of August and early September out here. I think a lot of these areas and even into Colorado is going to be a problem. But I think what the model is doing for October, November is erasing that big old uh, dry pocket across the, the Great Plains and the Western Plain. Look over here, East Texas, Louisiana, all the way up uh, parts of the Tennessee Valley. They're wetter than normal. November, December, January, wetter than normal here, East Texas. But this, this is big. This is big because if we can get that drought erased, West Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, and get some moisture in the soil, that's going to be a big, big help to us. As I said, I threw a lot at you. I don't expect you to get it all. If you have questions, I put my email address on there for a reason, because there is so much bad information out there right now in the science community. And I'm not the smartest guy in the room when it comes to this. But I will, if I don't know something and I don't know the answer to the question you're asking, I will go find someone who can answer that for you. If you have questions, put my email to use right there. You can also feel free to come visit me at the Southern Livestock Standard booth. I'm here through today and tomorrow. Um, love to talk to you guys, okay, about anything. And then the beauty of social media, I'm on Twitter. I'm also on Facebook too, but for a lot of this stuff, I, Twitter's a better medium for me, okay? I thank you all for having me.